Velkommen til at komme her og takke som er afternoon. Spring afternoon. And thank you for being part of the political revolution. And what that means is that we are here to obviously win the state of Iowa. I think we're going to do that. We are here to win the Democratic nomination. I think we're going to do that. to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of our country. But we are here to do something even more than that. And that is, we are coming together in this campaign, an unprecedented campaign, which now has more than one million volunteers. And, and thousands of volunteers right here in Iowa. That's how light show you see. But we're here to do something different. Right? It's a different message than any other campaign that's out there. And the campaign's message is us not me. And that message means that we are about not just winning the election, but transforming this country. Yeah. And I think one of the very serious political problems that exist in our country today is that people hear politicians on television saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the other thing. But somehow, not much changes. Yeah. Same old, same old goes on, and people get discouraged, and they don't vote. They give up on democracy. So what we are about when we say, us, not me, it is about taking on the very powerful special interests who control our economic and political life. Yeah. you a lot of things that we're going to do, but I can't do it as president unless we have millions of people standing with me demanding that change. Yeah. So let me give you a few examples. The American people increasingly understand that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And what that means is that the United States must join every other major country on earth, not a radical idea here, and create a system that guarantees health care to every man, woman, and child. Does anyone here think that that is a radical idea? No! It is not a radical idea. It is what should exist in a democratic, civilized society. It is not widely reported, but we lose some 30,000 people a year because they don't have health insurance or, like many of you, they are underinsured with large deductibles and co-payments. And if people don't have any money or they have a large deductible and a large co-payment, they hesitate to go to the doctor when they get sick. And if you hesitate to go to the doctor when you get sick, it is likely you're going to get sicker. Yes. And maybe end up in the emergency room, which is the most expensive form of health care in America. 
well maybe you end up in the hospital. So what we believe as a moral right is that whether you are rich or whether you are poor, you should be able to go to a doctor when you need to go to a doctor. That's the end of it. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak to some wonderful people at town meetings we did elsewhere in the state. And a woman told me, that her husband died earlier than he should have because they simply did not have the money to buy the prescription drugs he needed. And I can tell you that we have talked to families all over this country who have lost loved ones because they could not get the medicine that they needed at an affordable cost. How does that happen? It happens because of the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. It happens because they have contributed hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to politicians in campaign contributions, and they have lobbyists, thousands of lobbyists, all over this country, making sure that states or the U.S. Congress do not do the right thing to protect consumers. So right now, you can walk into your pharmacy's office tomorrow and find the price of the medicine you've been using for 10 years has doubled. And you say, how does that happen? And the answer is, it can happen, it does happen, simply because it can happen. And these guys want to make as much money as they possibly can. Last year, listen to this, the top 10 drug companies in America made 69 billion dollars in profit. <laughs> Meanwhile, elderly people in Iowa and in Vermont cut their pills in half, which is a bad thing to do because they can't afford the medicine that they need. And one out of five Americans, listen to this, one out of five Americans who get a prescription from a doctor cannot afford to fill that prescription because of the price. So what are we going to do about it? Well, good question. Thank you for asking it. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to lower drug prices in this country by 15%. Okay? And through our Medicare for All proposal, we're going to make sure that every American, regardless of income, gets the prescription drugs that they need. Idea. It is not a radical idea. Because all that cutting drug costs in this country by 50% would do is bring us to where other countries around the world are. Okay, I'll tell you a brief story. About 20 years ago, when I was a, a congressman before I made it to the Senate for Vermont, I took a busload of working class women across the Canadian border, uh, not to go sightseeing to Montreal but to buy prescription drugs. And I will never forget walking into the pharmacy with them in Montreal, and we had arranged all of this, so I knew what was gonna happen. But they purchased tamoxifen, which is a widely prescribed breast cancer drug, and many of these women were struggling with breast cancer. They bought that medicine, the same exact medicine as they were using in Vermont and the United States, for one-tenth the price. Got it? So all over the world, what governments do is negotiate with the drug companies. They don't allow the drug companies to charge us any price, charge them any price they want. And therefore, their prices are much lower. So what we are going to do in terms of health care is a number of things. Number one, we are going to do what the American people want and that is to pass a Medicare for all single payer system. <laughs> Number two, we are going to lower drug costs in half. And number three, we are going to greatly expand primary health care in America. Right now, is there are parts of America where people
people who have insurance can't even find a doctor. Okay, and the end result is that we spend twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. Now here's a prediction. As there is more and more support for a Medicare for all single payer system, the insurance companies and the drug companies will fight back and they have endless amounts of money. And what they will end up doing is putting 30 second ads on television here in Iowa telling you what a terrible guy Bernie Sanders is. Ah. And you have to ask yourself, who is paying for those ads? Okay, and why aren't they putting them on? The function of our current healthcare system is what? Make money. It is to make as much money as possible for the drug companies and the insurance companies. And together, we are going to end that and create a system that works for all, not just the drug companies. Now, bring about change in this country, we have to do something that is not easy. We have to take on extraordinarily powerful special interests. You see, I could give you a speech and say, vote for me, I'm gonna do A, B, C, D, and E, and you'll say, that's great, but I would be lying to you if I told you that I could accomplish all of that unless millions of people were prepared to stand up and fight for those goals. distinguishes our campaign is that I have to be honest and to tell you that no president, not the best intention, the most honest person, can do it alone because the power structure of this country is such that if you look at Wall Street, if you look at the insurance companies, if you look at the drug companies, if you look at the fossil fuel industry, if you look at the military industrial complex, if you look at the prison industrial complex, all of these special interests and more make billions of dollars every single year. And they are not going to give up their profiteering and they're not going to give up their power unless the American people stand up and demand it. is doing something unprecedented here in Iowa and in fact all over the country. And that is putting together the strongest grassroots political movement that this country has ever seen. <laughs> what is going on today, and I don't have to tell you this because you know it as well as I do, we have an economy in which the very, very rich are doing phenomenally well. An economy in which Wall Street and corporate profits are soaring. And yet here in Iowa and in Vermont and all across this country, you got millions and millions of people working longer hours for lower wages. You got half of our population living paycheck to paycheck. Do you all know what I mean? I grew up in a family that lived paycheck to paycheck. Do you all know what I mean? Living paycheck to paycheck? This is what it means. And a lot of folks out there, you know, big wealthy campaign contributors, they have no idea what the average American is going through. This is paycheck to paycheck. You got a car, an old car. Car breaks down. And you need $500 to fix that car. Well, if you got a lot of money, 500 bucks, isn't a big deal. You take it to the service station, they fix it in your own way. Or you use your second car or your third car. All right? But what happens here with average working stiff? You may not have that 500 bucks. And if you can't repair that car, you can't get to work. And if you can't get to work, you get fired. And if you get fired, you can't put food on the table for your kids. That's what living paycheck to paycheck is about. Some of you may know this and some of you may not.
But in America today, for the last three years actually, we have seen a decline in life expectancy. Do you know that? Yeah. Means people, I mean this is really an ahistorical phenomenon. Because all over the world, and in this country, every year the trend is people are living a little bit long. And in America now, we are living a little bit short. And the reason for that is what doctors describe as diseases of despair. Is that so many people have given up hope for a better life for themselves and for their kids that they are turning to alcohol, they are turning to drugs and opioids, and they are, in rural states especially, in agricultural areas, even committing suicide. Okay. That is a reality that we have to address. And that means we have got to give hope to people who today do not have hope. Yeah. And the way we do that, the way we do that is demand that we have a government and an economy that works for you and you and you and ordinary Americans and not just the top 1%. Some truths. Here are some truths that you're not going to see on television. It's not going to be on corporate TV, and it's not going to be in many of the national newspapers. And you have to decide, we have to decide as a people, whether this is what we want as a nation. Today in America, you got three families that own more wealth than the bottom half of America. You got the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. And today in Iowa, and I talk to people in your state all over the time, people who are making 8 bucks an hour, 9 bucks an hour, 10 bucks an hour, 49%, almost half of all new income is going to the top 1%. So we don't have to deal with that reality. We can't sweep it under the rug, and we have to create an economy that works for all people. So what does that mean? It means that if you work 40 hours a week in Iowa, in Vermont, or any place else in America, you should not be living in poverty. of marching with some very, very brave people uh, at McDonald's. And these people in Cedar Rapids, they went out on strike in order to tell the McDonald's they cannot make it on nine bucks an hour or 10 bucks an hour. They need 15 bucks an hour in Iowa. $15 an hour does not get you rich, that's for sure, but at least gives you a minimum level of security. And I am proud to tell you, and this is how change comes about, my message today is I would like people to think, how do we bring about change? Historically, how has it happened? And how it has always happened is from the bottom on up, never from the top on down. is the history of the union movement where 125, 150 years ago workers stood together. Some of them were beaten, they were fired, but they stood together and said, we are human beings, not animals. We will be treated with respect. is the history of the civil rights movement where millions of people, black and white, demanded an end to racism and segregation. 
it is the history, it is the history of the women's movement. A hundred years ago, women in America did not have the right to vote, did not have the right to get the education that they desired, did not have the right to do the work they wanted to do. But women stood up and fought back. We still have a long way to go. We know it. All right? We know what's going on in Alabama and Missouri yeah. and in other states. And by the way, in my view, the right for a woman to control her own body is a constitutional right.
and repel the fossil fuel industry. I'm going to say a word about the fossil fuel industry. Or a lot of words about the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> Some of you may know the history of tobacco in this country. And you may remember a very famous picture of uh, the CEOs of the major cigarette com uh, companies going before Congress. Anyone remember that? And they raised their right hand under oath. And the members of Congress, and I knew some of them, uh, asked the executives, do you believe, is it your knowledge, that cigarettes cause cancer and other diseases? And they said, no, we don't believe that. They lied. And the result of those lies over years was that millions of people in our country and around the world, including my own father, who smoked two packs a day, died. Heart disease, in the case of my father, cancer, in the case of others, they lied about what they were doing. And that is exactly what the fossil fuel industry is doing today. They have scientists, they know it. They have scientists who are pretty smart and understand what the impact of carbon emissions is, and yet the executives keep lying. And today we say to the fossil fuel industry that your short-term profits, and they make billions of dollars every year, is not more important than the future of this planet. industry, which is a very, very powerful institution in Washington, when we take them on and we transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy, when we do that, we are going to create millions of good paying jobs. country in the history of the world. But most people don't know that because they're working too hard trying to put food on the table. And what we are going to do is take a hard look at the reality of life for the average American. Let's talk to little kids. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. And I get a little bit tired, I must tell you, from hearing from our Republican colleagues in the Senate about how much they love America, but apparently they don't love the children in this country and the future leadership of this country. Trump how is our child care system in this country? Uh, all over the country, in Vermont, here and I walk all over this country, and I want you to think about it. What the psychologists tell us who study children, child psychologists, tell us that the most important years of human development are zero through four, intellectually and emotionally. And yet you got working parents from coast to coast who cannot find quality, affordable child care. We are going to change that. We're going to provide universal quality child care for all families. And all across this country, all across this country, there are exceptions, but by and large, all across this country, you're seeing public school districts struggling with inadequate budgets. You are seeing teachers being forced to take money out of their own pockets to buy supplies for their children. And I want to applaud, in the last year, teachers from all across this country who went out on strike, who marched, and who demonstrated, who demanded that their kids get a piece of education. America. It is not a radical idea to suggest that we should have the best 
quality public education in the world. It is not a radical idea to say that we should pay our teachers and our child care workers the salaries that they work for us. child care, when we talk about public education, K-12, when we talk about higher education. You are living in a nation where, this year, today, hundreds of thousands of bright young people cannot afford to go to college. Think about how horrific that is. These are kids who have the ability, but they cannot afford to go to college. Some of them, some of them might end up, have been great scientists or teachers, they're never going to have that chance. And then you've got millions of others who did go to college, who left school deeply in debt. Well, it is again not a radical idea to say that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, people should not have to go deeply into debt because they got a college education. Critics will say, well, Bernie's a nice guy, he wants to make public colleges and universities tuition free, he wants to substantially lower student debt, how are you going to pay for all that? I will tell you exactly how we're going to pay for that. Ten years ago, you helped bail out the crooks on Wall Street. Now it is Wall Street's turn to help the working class out this country. A modest transaction fee tax on Wall Street speculation will make public colleges and universities tuition free. And that's what I'm talking about. Four years ago when I came to Iowa, I said we got to deal with a broken criminal justice system. A system that has more people in jail than any other country on earth. And one of the things that we have got to do is to end the so-called war on drugs. And I am very happy to tell you that not only over the years, recent years, have we made progress in raising the minimum wage, on changing consciousness about health care for all, but we have made real progress in either decriminalizing or legalizing the possession of marijuana. And when we talk about criminal justice reform, it also means that instead of investing in more jails and incarceration, we are going to invest in our young people in jobs and education. Now, I want to say a word to some of our seniors who may be watching this or here this evening. And that is, I do not know how 20% of seniors make it when they are living on $13,500 or less. I have no idea how anybody survives on that limited income. So we have a situation, as many of you know, we're in Washington. My Republican colleagues want to cut Social Security significantly giving a trillion and a half dollars in tax breaks to the 1% and large private corporations, they have concluded that the deficit is too hot and the way to deal with that is to cut Social Security. Well, we've got some very bad news for them. We are not going to cut Social Security, we're going to expand Social Security.
for the seniors, I also want to say this. Medicare is a very strong program, and as I've just indicated, I want to see it expanded to all of our people over a four-year period. But Medicare today has its limitations. Medicare today does not cover dental care.